Hello and welcome to the Adobe Twitch channel. My name is Terry White, worldwide designer and photography evangelist for Adobe, and it's my pleasure to stream live here for the next, uh, I don't know, 60 minutes or so. We're going to be doing uh, Light Intro to Lightroom CC Part 2 of the eight-part series of our Creative Cloud Learning Stream. As a matter of fact, uh, let's queue up the Learning Stream uh, lower third there and this is uh, something that I started um, doing with Photoshop we did a 10 part series last month or month and a half ago on uh, intro to Photoshop so twice a week five weeks uh, intro to Photoshop from the very beginning all the way out to the end the 10 things people want to know how to do so we're doing the same thing with Lightroom it's a little bit shorter it's only eight parts um, and it's not because we couldn't do 10 it's just because we only did eight uh, so I'm here streaming live on Tuesdays and Fridays today being Friday uh, this is part two and welcome back for those of you who attended part one welcome back for those of you who were in my first hour and welcome to all the people that are new and the people watching the replay or video on demand so speaking of that if you are watching the replay and the video on demand thank you um, we are streaming live, so therefore you will see me pause every now and then and look over at my iPad, which is sitting here, and I will address questions as best I can. And um, okay, and address people in the uh, chat from time to time. And so, if you did have a question you wanted to get asked or answered, I should say. Uh, then that would be the best way to do it is head over to twitch.tv slash Adobe on Tuesdays and Fridays from 10 a.m. Eastern till noon Eastern and I'll be live and you can ask questions and I will and hopefully I'll see them in the chat and I'll be able to answer them. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and kick things into gear for our part two of uh, Intro to Lightroom collections, smart collections and collections versus folders. And we'll pick up right where we left off with the catalog we were working on um, Tuesday. The one we created from scratch. The one that I did two imports into. One from a card. One from some files that were already in a folder. We talked about where the files physically are. We talked about uh, converting the DNG. We did all that. And, and then that was the end of the stream. So I didn't change anything in the catalog. I just opened it back up just now today. And now we're back to that catalog to continue our work. So uh, for those of you who are just joining, I've got two folders. Uh, so there's the first, there's actually the second folder, the one from Auckland, where I did some HDRs or bracketed exposure for HDR. And I've got this um, uh, first folder we imported of Gina and her daughter. And we were just doing some uh, portrait work back in the day, back in 2000, whatever year this was, 2010. Uh, so it's just a folder of files I use for demo. Now, all together, you can see this happened to just be a coincidence that there are 21 images in each one, and there are 42 photos all together being referenced by Lightroom. So that's what that 42 count is. Um, now, let's talk about, let's start off with the folders versus collections. And we'll talk about, we haven't created any collections yet, but we'll talk about what collections are for. And when you would use them, why you would use them, some of the ways I use them. And we'll also then get into what smart collections are. But first, let's deal with collections versus folders. And that's really the main thing we want to get across today. Because I get this question all the time. Why do I need collections? I can see all my images. They're in a folder. I'm looking at them. If I want to go look at a different set of images, I go to the different folder. Makes sense, right? Except when you want to combine things or eliminate things that you don't want to see. Now, you can do some elimination just by what you choose to look at in the filter menu up here. So in the filter menu, I could say, for example, maybe I only want to see my um, landscape images versus my portraits, meaning landscape versus tall. So I could go in to the, not the attributes, to the metadata, and I could find the metadata for, oh, what would it be called? It would be called aspect ratio. And I could say, 
show me just the landscapes. And that does narrow it down. So, Terry, why do I need a collection? I can narrow it down to just the ones I want to see um, using these filters. Show me just the ones that are portrait. Don't show me the landscapes anymore. And you're right. You could do it that way. But now you're creating a lot of work to have to do it that way every single time you want to make a, a distinction. What if I just want to see the ones with her daughter? Well, there's no filter for that. Now I'd have to go create keywords and filter on the keywords and do all that. So in other words, yes, you can just get by with folders if for whatever reason you're afraid of collections, but collections just make your work so much easier. And where collections really start to shine is when you want to see photos from different folders together. So for example, maybe I did... Uh, two portrait shoots with Gina. I did one in 2010. I did one in 2015, which I, or not 15, but 14, which I actually did. So they're going to be in two different folders. And I want to see this first image and the 20th image in the second folder. I want to see both of those together. Well, if, as long as I'm clicked on one folder or the other, I would never be able to do that. But if I put them in a collection, not a problem. So let's, let's define what collections are. And then it'll make more sense. And the analogy that we always like to use when comparing uh, collections to um, something that will make sense to you is, if you think about your music, think about the music you manage and um, whether you're using iTunes or something else, whatever you're using, I would bet that that music application has the ability to show you all your songs. If you got 10,000 songs, it will show them all to you. Just like I can see all 42 photos. They're all there. Okay. Or I can go to an individual folder. In this case, that would be like an individual album or artist. And it would show me all the songs for that album or artist. But when I go to listen to my music, I don't listen to it all at one time or only by a specific album or only by a specific artist. I like to create, and you, you've guessed it, playlists. Now, playlist, as you know, in music or any music app can contain songs from anywhere, any album, any folder, any, you know, genre, any artist. You can just put them in the collection or I'm sorry, in the um, playlist any way you want. You can change the order. You can duplicate the song as many times as you want and hear it over and over again and hear this song and then hear another song and then hear that song again. So playlists allow you to arrange your music any way you want without duplicating the music. You can have the same song in 20 different playlists and it does not duplicate that song. It doesn't take up any extra space to have the same song in 20 different playlists. So think of your collections as playlists for your photos or albums, basically. A way to create a organization method that does not mess with the folders does not duplicate anything, does not move anything. It, the images stay where they are on your drives, but the collection allows me to see them any way that I want and use them any way that I want going forward. That's what collections are for. And there's no reason in the world not to use collections. I can't think of a single reason why I would only want to use folders. Collections are just so much nicer. I can do anything I want, arrange them any way I want. And more importantly, as we get to it in a later session, in a few, in, I don't know what, which one I'd have to look, which one it's going to be, but whether it's part four or five or six, when we get to Lightroom Mobile, you're going to have to use collections anyway. <laughs> you want to take advantage of Lightroom Mobile. So you might as well start now. All right, so what? how do we create a collection and what's a collection going to be? Well, the easiest way to create a collection is to start with the photos you want to put in that collection. That's where I usually start. So if I want to make a Gina collection or Gina favorites or best of, then for example, I might say, well, I really like this one. And I really like this one where she's smiling. And I really like this cute one with her daughter, actually her daughter, that one where they're both smiling, kind of. And I like this one where she looks confident. Okay, so I've select, I just held on my command key and picked four or five different photos or PC control key and pick them individually. Now that I've got those selected, those are like the, the ones I really like right now. 
I may like more later, might like less later. But those are the ones I really like right now. Under your Collections tab here in um, Lightroom, you've got the ability to click the plus sign and create a collection. When you create collection, it'll bring up a dialog box so you can name it. You could put it in a collection set, which we don't have yet. And more importantly, it will default to including the selected photos. In other words, include the photos I've just highlighted. I spent time highlighting those for a reason. I want them to be in the collection. If you didn't highlight them or didn't do it, you can create an empty collection and then drag them in. So it's not a one-time shot if you don't do it right the first time. So I can call this um, Gina Favorites. Uh, Gina Best Of. Gina... Um, Gina, you know, fashion, Gina and daughter, I can't remember her daughter's name, but Gina and daughter, whatever it is. And whatever you want to name that collection, you name it whatever you want. Uh, so we'll go ahead and create it. And now you notice what it just did. It created this collection called Gina Favorites and it says, says four. And it dropped those four images into this collection. Now, collections versus folders. They're still all in the folder. You haven't changed a single thing about those images. You haven't changed anything. They're still there. All you're saying is, I only want to look at these four by going to that collection. That's what collections are for. Let me look at the comments real quick. Okay. Uh, I'm a graphic designer. Oh, many times I have addressed them. What room? What is the best practice I should use? Two terabytes. Okay. I'm a graphic designer and I'm using Bridge to organize all my stock photos and many times I have to adjust them, adjust some of them on Lightroom. What is the best practice to use to organize it all? Well, it depends. Um, because you said you're a graphic designer so I can understand why you'd use Bridge. If you were a photographer, I would just say do it all in, in Lightroom. But since you're a graphic designer and you're using Lightroom for adjustments, which I'm not quite sure why, because the adjustments you'd be doing, you could be doing in Bridge with Camera Raw. So I don't understand quite where, where Lightroom fits into that particular workflow. Now, if you told me I'm a graphic designer and I'm using my own photos and they're in Lightroom, and I also use Bridge, then that's a different story. But if you're just using Lightroom for the adjustments of stock photos, then I would say that's probably not a good use of Lightroom because you could organize, uh, you could keep just keep organizing folders and use the um, develop module in, I'm sorry, not the develop module, the camera raw option in Bridge and make the same kind of adjustments you'd be making in Lightroom. However, if you're trying to say, hey, I use Lightroom to store all my images, whether they're stock or not, meaning manage them, I should say, not store, manage them, um, then that's a good use. Then I would ask, well, what do you, what, why does Bridge have to fit into it? So that's what I'm saying. I'm trying to understand why you're using both for the images. Bridge is great for everything else, for looking at InDesign files, PDFs, Illustrator files, and basically, it's a file browser. It looks at a folder and shows what's in it. Lightroom, on the other hand, is managing the metadata of those images and managing things like collections and output and all the other things we're talking about. So it just really depends on what the what the end goal is at the end of the day. Um, I would say use Lightroom for managing the images. Use Bridge for everything else. If you need to use Bridge at all, but use Bridge for everything else. Um, okay, good question. I draw for me. Uh, so the question was, hey, when you imported those images from your hard drive, these, why weren't they converted into DNG like the ones you did when you brought them in from the card? Good question. Because when you import your images from your card, that is an option. I'm using the regular import and it has to copy that inf copy those files from the card. And while it's copying, once it's done copying, you can say convert to DNG. That's an option in the import dialog box anytime you're copying data from one place to another. However, if you've already put the images on your drive, which I did for the second folder for these, and they're already there, and you're just adding them into Lightroom, 
that has converting to DNG has just never been an option for the add part. It could be, it just never has made it as an option. So how would I get these to be DNG since they were already there on the drive and all I did was add them in the Lightroom? And it's an easy way to do it. Select all, library, convert photos to DNG. You can do it after the fact, by the way. You don't have to do it upon import. And even when you do it on import now, it's still doing it after the fact. It's just doing it as one extra step that you don't have to do manually. So in this case, since I did an add, I do have to do it manually, meaning select them all and do this dialog box and just click OK. And now what it's doing in the background, just like it did before, is it's converting these to DNG and it's going pretty quick. And once these are converted, it's putting, once it successfully converts them, it's putting the original raw files in my trash can, in my recycle bin on Windows. So um, once I empty trash, then those NEFs are gone. So it's replacing them in place. It's keeping any adjustments I've made. It's keeping any collections I've done. It's doing everything in place and just simply replacing those NEFs as DNGs as quickly as my computer will allow. And it's a background process, so I don't have to wait for that to finish. Okay, so that answers that. I never like bridge. All right. Well, I never like using bridge for photography, but I do use it for the other aspects of bridge for design. Okay. All right. Uh, so, and so now it's finished. So now if we go back and look at those, those are DNGs now. So thanks for reminding me to do my conversion. <laughs> and so now that's done. Okay. So now let's go back to the collection. Oops, this collection. So we got our collection here and, um, Let's, I know this has nothing to do with it, but let's say, for the sake of example, I go here and I like this photo, even though it has nothing to do with Gina and Gina was not in Auckland. <laughs> but let's say, for the sake of example, she was in Auckland at the time I took this photo and she wants that to be part of the memory, which I'm making this up as I go along. But let's say we drag that one in. We can put that one in the collection as well. So this is why I said collections are definitely better for organization than folders because I didn't move that photo. I didn't move it from its location. I just added it to this collection. And now that it's here, I can rearrange the order. I can put them anywhere, in any order I want to tell the story. You know, she arrived in Auckland and then we went to the photo, the studio and did a photo shoot. You know, and then we did the next thing, which would be the next photo from a different folder, a different date, a different whatever. And I'm building my collection, my story. Now, I told you I'd give you some examples of when I use collections. Um, all right, hang on. I see a question here. My photos import as CR2 files. Is there a difference between the different raw formats? Yes, there is a difference. And it's just they're different because they're each one's by its own manufacturer. So CR2 tells me you're a Canon shooter. That's what CR2s are. They're Canon RAW files. Uh, NEF would be Nikon. AR, ARWs are Sony's. So it just depends on the manufacturer. That's it. They're proprietary. That's why we convert them to DNG or that's why I convert them to DNG. So now they're no longer proprietary. Now, uh, this, these DNGs will last forever because anyone can write a DNG converter or viewer or processor. Um, and I, if Canon, heaven forbid, or Nikon, heaven forbid, or Sony, heaven forbid, or Fuji, for heaven forbid, ever A, went out of business, or B, stopped supporting the CR2 format because they moved to the CR3 format. By the way, whatever happened to CR1? Was that a format one day? I don't know. So if they ever stop supporting that format, I don't have to worry about my software not supporting it anymore. That's why we do the conversion to DNG. Um, and CR2, that does bring up the question, was there a CR1 and what happened to it? All right, but anyway. Uh, so that's why, that's the answer to your question. It's just, it's just each company caused their extension something different. All right, so back to the collection thing. So we're in our collection. We put the photos in, we uh, put them in any order we want. We can add more later, we can remove them. So for example, let's say now all of a sudden I talk to her and she hates this photo and doesn't want it to be part of the story. Delete, <gasps> yes, I deleted a photo. 
from a collection. Still got 21 Gina photos in the folder. So just like you delete a song you're tired of from a playlist. You rearrange it so it's not playing five times. You're only playing two times. You, you, you remove it or move it to the end. It does not affect the library. In this case, it does not affect the catalog. This catalog still references all 21 Gina photos. I just said I don't want to see that one here anymore. So back to the uh, how I use collections. So I use collections. Um, one of the first uses I use collections for is my portfolio. Now, when we, in one of the later um, segments, probably part four or five, when we switch back to my normal catalog, um, you'll see I have a portfolios, a whole portfolio section, portfolio fashion, portfolio beauty, portfolio fitness, portfolio travel, portfolio landscapes, portfolio iPhone. So I have each collection of my top 24, 30, whatever number I pick photos that's always, always represents my collection. If I get a new photo that I like, like I just did a shoot today. And I like that photo so much that it's portfolio worthy and therefore it's going to my portfolio. Then what that means is I'll drag it into that collection, whatever collection it should go in. And I'm also trying to be strict on myself and not having a collection of a hundred or portfolio of a hundred photos. I keep it to a number. I think my current number is 30 now and or 26. I don't remember whatever it is. I then have to say, okay, I'm not going to have 31. So that means if this photo is so good that I'm putting it in my portfolio, that means the weakest photo now has to go. And I find, I figure out in my head, whatever's the weakest photo, click on it and delete it from the collection. So now I've still got 30 of my best of. And that what that does is it forces you as a photographer to keep your, not only your portfolio fresh, but to keep it focused on the best images. So your portfolio continues to get better. If a photo is good enough to go in it, then that means it has to be good enough to knock something else out. If it's not good enough to knock something else out, then it doesn't go in. That's just my philosophy on portfolios, but that's how I use collections. Now I use collections for a whole bunch of other things too. I have collections for events that I do or shoot. So I was just at the CAS 2016 um, uh, photography event in Detroit this past weekend. So I created a CAS 2016 collection of all the photos and selfies and things I took there, whether it was a DSLR, smartphone, or whatever. And that collection makes up that event. And so I have collections for anything, for anything that I want to, want to organize by or go back and look at, whether it's a trip, family outing, uh, family reunion, uh, um, work event, or portfolio or whatever whatever you can think of as a way that you would want to be able to look at photos that's what collections are for all right uh let's see what else okay uh, i draw for me sorry you got to take off we'll catch you next time is there a way to change the color or a frame to distinguish between a collection or image in the library Okay, is there a way to change the color of the frame to distinguish a collection, distinguish between a collection or image in the library? No, there isn't. The only way you would change the color of the frame is you would be flagging the image with a color. So for example, if I go here and I say that we haven't gotten into, we're gonna have a whole section on flagging, rating, stars, and all that. But if I say that this is a green photo, now that frame changes to green, but that's changing to green everywhere it is. So it's here green and it's here green as well. So that would be the only way to change the frame color. Um, okay. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, Flo, that's, yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely go in. Uh, Flo says she went in and changed all her NEF files to DNG from the Armageddon one day when Nikon decides to not support that NEF format anymore, which that could that day could never come, or that day could come next year. We never know. 
but we have seen formats come and go, and that's why we like to keep them in open standards or open standards from the standpoint of they can always be read by somebody by something. All right, uh, so let's keep going with collections. We're about halfway through here. Um, I just want to check one more thing here. And um, what was I going to do next? We're going to do collections, smart collections. And there was one more thing I was about to do. Oh, I lost it. Okay. Well, it's, oh, no, I remember smart collections. So let's talk about smart collections now. And we'll talk about collection sets. We'll do both. Uh, let's do collection sets because it's easier. Let's say that I want... Gina's like the first person I imported into this catalog. But I'm going to be doing... I'm a portrait photographer. So therefore, I'm going to be doing portrait shoots and importing portraits from here on out. As a matter of fact, we can do one more here. Let's do this real quick. We do this in the background. So I'm going to open up a files uh, or file here, a folder, and it's in my demo files, and it's in my raw files, and it's. We'll do this one. So I'm going to go ahead and import one more folder into this catalog. And this is actually from a file server. So this proves the point that images can be imported from um, not just from your local desktop or from a memory card. All right, so these are all coming in, and I've got a mixture of things in this folder. But I'm going to go ahead and bring them all in. Build smart previews, include the subfolders, uh, do all the things that we talked about. Now, this is where I get to say, um, uh, I did. I skipped this because we hadn't talked about collections yet on Tuesday. So now in the import process, you have the ability to add to collection at the same time. So if I click add to collection, and I don't want to add them to the Gina favorites because this has nothing to do with Gina. I can now add these to, um, I don't know his name, but we'll call him Jeff for now. It's Ashley's boyfriend. We'll call him Jeff. Jeffrey. All right, so we have a Jeffrey collection. And I'm going to go ahead and click create because I just made it on the fly. And now we'll import those in as an add because they're already where I want them to be. There's no reason to copy or move them or do anything. So just import. And what it's doing right now is quickly referencing those photos. Add is always much faster than copy because it doesn't have to really do much. So now it's building smart previews, which is great. But now I've got some uh, images in this. Oh, and by the way, once it builds the smart previews, the next step will be drop them in the collection. So it's added the Randy. Oh, his name was Randy. Uh, or at least that's the name I gave him that day. Uh, that's a really nice name. I think I made that up too. But anyway, it's added the Randy and Mask training folder on a separate drive. Because remember, I talked about this on Tuesday. The drive won't show up here unless you have um, used it. So I hadn't used my server before, but now I just did. So Randy's folder is showing up here. And so we'll keep it consistent. We'll read, well, let it finish first and I'll rename that collection. So it's, it's brought them in, it's building the smart previews. And the last step when it's finished building the smart previews is it will drop them in that collection. And in the meantime, that's a backroom process or background process. I don't have to deal with it. So we started off talking about collection sets. So what's a collection set? I mentioned that I'm going to shoot portraits. So now I have two sets of portraits, Gina and what will ultimately be the Randy collection. That list is going to get quite long eventually. The more people I shoot, the longer that list is going to keep growing. So this collection list is going to be a mile long as a portrait photographer. So what I can do is create what's called a collection set. Just think of it as a folder. That's really all it is. So if I create a collection set called portraits, I can, oh, no, I don't want to include it in a collection set. Let's go ahead and just do it. And so now I've got this folder, which I can now drag the Gina favorites into it. And as soon as we're done with, once this is populated and once I rename it, we'll put that one in there as well. So that allows me to twirl it up and not see that mile long list when I'm looking for something else. Okay, so it finished. It dropped in those 20 photos. I'm now going to rename this. 
and we're going to rename this Randy to keep it consistent with the folder name. Again, I made that up, but we'll then drop that in as well. And so now I've got those two collections in a collection set called portraits. And those two, and by the way, when I click on the whole collection set, it shows me everything. If I twirl down and say, just show me Gina's or just show me Randy's, it shows me Randy's. Now, also, well, wait, hold on. I see images in here that have nothing to do with him. They just happen to be in the same folder. So these are all an Italian mask. I can just select all those and say, hey, I want a new collection. Create a new collection. Don't put it in the collection set and call it Italian masks. Now, it did that. It put those eight photos in that new collection called Italian mask, but it did not remove them. It does not automatically remove them from the other collection. So now, same eight photos are in two collections. They're in the Randy one, and they're in the Italian mask one. If I don't want them in the Randy one anymore, delete. Now they're not in the Randy one anymore. And I took these wine bottle shots when I was in Singapore. So yeah, see Singapore test. Let's make a collection called Singapore. And no, it's not, it has nothing to do with portraits. So take it out of the portrait set. So now it's in a Singapore set or collection. And so I have a set called portraits that has Gina and Randy. And let's get rid of these wine bottles out of Randy. And now I've got Gina and Randy. That's not his name, but <laughs> that was the name I thought of at the time. And I've got the other collections for Italian masks and Singapore. Has nothing to do with the folders. The folders still have the images where they are. So that's why we create collections so we can manage things the way we want. If I want to create another collection set called travel, and I want to put the Singapore in the travel collection set, now all my travel collections will be grouped together. So that's what these collection sets are for. And that's because it just keeps the list nice and short. You can twirl up the one you don't need. Now, um, here's another advantage to Lightroom CC that's happened in. Hang on, hold on, hold on. Dun, 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 dun. Just making sure. Glad I got you not scared anymore, um, Flo. Got, got you prepared. And boy fruit. Yeah, quick time on Windows not being supported anymore. You never know. Yep, came out of nowhere. So you, you don't want to rely on formats that are proprietary when you can avoid it. And DNG helps you avoid it. Okay, so anyway, back to the collections. Um, I got distracted when I read that. So let's say, oh, this came out in Lightroom CC in one of the later updates. But obviously, now that you have collection sets and you bury collections in them, you may not remember where you put a particular collection. Like, did I put Singapore in travel or did I put it in the Create Now tour collection set? You know, because it was part of Create Now, but it was also travel. Which one did I put it in? I don't remember. So if you can't remember where a collection is, but you remember what you called it, now there's a filter box for your collection. So you can say, just show me Singapore. Oh, there's Singapore. I don't remember where it is. Now I see it's in travel, and now I can get right to it. Or show me Gina. I don't remember. Oh, it's in portraits, and now I can get right to it. So I love the filter because sometimes I do put collections and collection sets and can't remember which collection set I put it in. Or I don't feel like drilling down and finding it. It's buried a mile long, so no problem. I just type in the person's name, and boom, all their collections come up. So if I have more than one collection for Gina, all her collections will appear right there, no matter which collection set they're in. So that's uh, collection sets. Okay, so we've got 20 minutes left. We've got plenty of time. Let's talk about um, and sure enough, my chat is not keeping up. Oh no, that chat's actually not keeping up. Okay, let me refresh this. Uh, let's talk about smart collections, which is another major benefit um, for you guys once you get going with uh, Lightroom. So, smart collections 
are just that. They're collections based on criteria that automatically prop populate. So for example, maybe I want a smart collection of any photo that has, I'm just trying to think of what I have here. Um, also, I haven't done some things yet, so I'm trying to make this work without showing other things I haven't done yet that are coming in later episodes. All right, we're going to have to. I have no choice. Or no, I do have a choice. I want to see all, I want to see all portrait land orientation. All portrait. Or I want to see all the ones taken with a particular camera. Or I want to see all the ones that, you know, and this is what I was going to get into, five-star ratings or have a specific keyword or whatever. You can create a smart collection based on anything. Now, um, I like to have smart, uh, well, I'll give you this example after we create one. Let's do it first. All right, so let's, there is a, there's a collection set that Lightroom, the Lightroom team gave you called Smart Collections. And if we twirl this one down, there are some in here already, that, that some samples they've created. Anything colored with the color red, anything that's five stars, anything in the past, shot in the past month, anything recently modified, any video files, anything without keywords, all of them are without keywords. So it populated them all. So um, by the way, so what does that mean? It means that none of these have keywords yet of my all 62 photos I have. So if I were to go and add a keyword to any one photo, so let's say we add a keyword to this one and we call it, we add the keyword sweater because she's wearing a sweater. Notice it now says 61 because it's a smart collection and it says I'm constantly looking at your whole library for anything that matches this criteria. So the criteria was show me images without keywords because they put that in there so you would have a quick way to get to any photos that need keywords. Since I added at least one keyword to one photo, now the count dropped from 62 down to 61 because that one photo no longer meets the criteria. It has a keyword. So I'm going to create a new smart collection. And by the way, you don't have to put it in this collection set unless you want to. But since we have it, I'm going to use it. I'm going to create a smart collection. And this is where you get all your criteria. Um, portrait. You can name it whatever you want, portrait orientation. And yes, put it in a smart collection set or not, up to you. And then you get all this criteria. You can choose whatever you want. So I want to choose, I gotta find it here. It's not any of those, it's not any of those. It's not that. I never remember size and maybe aspect ratio. So see, they, they bury all this stuff in these subcategories to make this list short, but it ends up being long. <laughs> Once you go, or it ends up being harder to find stuff. So aspect ratio. So show me all photos in my entire catalog that are in portrait or landscape or square. So I just want to see portrait orientation. Create. Boom. 26 photos automatically in this collection. I didn't have to go through and find them. I didn't have to go through and manually drag them in. And if I change the orientation of the photo, which I don't know if cropping would actually do it since it's not instructive. But regardless, these images are now automatically put in this collection. Anytime I add new images that are portrait, they will automatically get added to this collection. Anytime I delete images from the catalog, they will automatically be taken out of this collection. So the collection, the smart collections are active all the time. They're always active. Uh, and they will always show you what's going on. Okay, next. Um, you can have multiple criteria. So I'm going to show you something that I do uh, since I've got a few minutes to do it. And this will help you understand uh, kind of maybe a better use for smart collections. So I have a smart collection for each year that I've been shooting. I've been shooting since 2006, I think, 2007 in my main catalog. So there's a 2006 year, 2007 year, 2008, all the way up to 2016. I don't want every photo I've shot in the year. 
because there are like all these pictures of Ashley's boyfriend, I may have only used one of them. Or all these pictures of Gina. I may only use three of them, whatever it is. So I don't really want to see every photo I've taken all year long. What I want to see are the edits for a particular photo in a particular year. Because those are the ones that matter. If I edited the photo, if I retouched it, if I did something to it, then that means that photo counts. That means I've done, I've used that photo and that photo is a keeper. That means that photo is one that I want to see in that smart collection. Doesn't mean I'm throwing away the other ones just yet. Doesn't mean the other ones don't count. What I want to see are all my edits for each year. So how does this work? Let's pick one. Um, we'll retouch it really quick. Let's grab this one. Uh, we'll go develop module. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Where am I first? Let's go back to her collection. There we go. And we'll grab this one. We'll go to the develop module. And we'll do some things to it. First and foremost, is there's lots of things wrong with this photo from a photography standpoint. The white balance is off. That should not be a bluish wall. That should be a gray wall. Uh, there's a lot of clipping in, well, not a lot, but a little clipping in the shadows. Let's bring that up a little bit. The exposure looks a little low. You got to remember, this is from 2010. I wasn't that good back then. <laughs> we can add a little vibrance to it. We can uh, increase the contrast. And then there are some things that I want to now go ahead and, and make better in Photoshop. So I've, I've made my adjustments here. And we're going to also apply a little sharpening to it. I've made my adjustments here, and now I want to go ahead and edit this in Photoshop. So I just, by the way, since you're a beginner, I hit the keyboard command, Command E, PC, Control E. You could also right click and say edit in Photoshop, and it will transfer a copy of the photo because it was raw. You can't edit a raw file to Photoshop, and I can then go in and do more things like that flyaway hair that we didn't see before. So let's get rid of that. We'll grab our... Um, Oh no, is my calibration off? My calibration may be off. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That was weird. System preferences. Oh, I gotta recalibrate this real quick. It takes a second. Hold on. Calibration. Calibrate. No, no, no. Wrong one. Wrong one. Escape. Escape. Wrong display. That's why. Calibrate my Cintiq. There we go. Tap. 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 This happens sometimes when you change displays and plug in a new display, whatever. The Cintiq needs to just be, just to realize where everything is again. Okay, so now that I've done that, uh, we'll go ahead and grab our um, our our <laughs> our uh, spot healing tool. Make my brush a little bit smaller, and we'll let you guys see what I'm doing as well. Let's go ahead and dial this down a little bit. And we'll just go ahead and just paint that hair out of there. And I gotta do a full retouch. This is not a retouching session, but just getting rid of some of these flyaways, some of these things that are, although you could do them in Lightroom, they're much easier, much faster uh, to do them here in Photoshop. Much more precise as well. So we do the global things. We can even use the adjustment brush in Lightroom which we're coming to all of that in another segment. But sometimes it's just easier to do this kind of stuff in right here in uh, Photoshop. All right, now the lighting was unflattering to her eye. That's a whole different story. Um, we're, again, for the sake of time, I'm not, <laughs> it just won't let me not do it. All right, let's duplicate that layer. <laughs> Let's completely remove it and then we'll dial it back in. So we're going to make it unrealistic first, completely get rid of it, and then we'll fade it back in as needed. All right, hide that selection, Command H, and now we can use the Edit Fade Patch to dial some of it back in so it doesn't look so unnatural. There we go. That's probably more like what her eye really looks like without the dark shadow under it. Okay, so click OK, deselect, that one's done. 
do the next one same thing I know this is not a Photoshop lesson but it's something that needs to be done hide the selection dial it back in edit fade patch tool fade, fade, fade patch selection now I can dial it all the way back in or dial it dial it in just enough to where it's more natural something more like along those lines okay click OK uh, I can keep the layer or not I choose not and last but not least I'm a stickler for wrinkles and clothes so let's go to a quick liquify oops <laughs> sorry <laughs> something was still selected deselect all right now I'll do a quick liquify there we go and let's dial that brush down a little bit and just quickly push in some of these wrinkles all right so this is typical my typical workflow is I would do a lot more but um, come into Photoshop and do these kind of Photoshop-esque things that Lightroom doesn't do. Lightroom doesn't have liquify. Lightroom doesn't have layers. Lightroom doesn't have the sophisticated retouching capabilities that I have inside of uh, Photoshop. So, and for the sake of time, we're almost out. But anyway, we'll freeze this part. That's going to be tricky. I would zoom in, take more time. But we'll go ahead and... Oop, didn't freeze it enough. Freeze, freeze, freeze. All right, I'm going to have to zoom in. There we go. This is why I hate coming into Photoshop when I'm not trying to teach Photoshop because I get distracted and carried away. All right, we'll do a better job on that when we come back, but there we go. So we did a couple tweaks, save it, close it, come back to Lightroom, and Lightroom will put the retouched, edited version right next to the original RAW file in the same collection. So the original RAW file is here, there's the DNG, and here's the edit. Not much of a change. Look at her eyes. Look at the sweater. That's about it. That's all we did. We got rid of some of that stray hair that you can't see anyway. All right. So now that I'm in this collection, well, do I need both of them in the collection anymore? No, because I already have an edit now. I don't need to see both of them. I need to keep both of them just in case. But, uh, oh, hang on. I'm not in that collection, am I? Oh, I'm not in the collection. That's why. Let's go to the Gina collection. There we go. Oh, and it didn't put it in there because I didn't do it there. Okay, go back, go back, go back. My bad. I was working in the folder, not the collection. Okay, so now we have this one. Now I can put that in the Gina collection <laughs> as an edit. So we've got it here. We'll put it where we want. I thought I was in the collection. I wasn't. But we're here in the collection with just the photos we want. So notice the difference. The original ones were DNGs. This one came back to Lightroom as a PSD or a TIFF, depending on your preferences. So I only want to see my edits, which I always bring them back as PSDs. So in order for me to see my edits in a collection for each year, first of all, I have to see which year this particular photo is. I think it's 2010. Uh, metadata. Yep, 2010. All right, so I want to see all my 2010 edits for this example. So we're going to go in and create a smart collection. And we're going to call it 2010 or 2010 edits. Um, we don't need to put it in a particular set just yet. And of course, we want it to match all of the following rules that I'm about to do. So the first rule is... Uh, date capture date is in the range of year first so 2010 January 1 till 2010 you got it December 31st All right, that's first. So that'll bring over all files that were taken that year. 
I don't want all files, just my edits. So we add another piece of criteria. You can add as many of these as you want. Second piece of criteria is file type is PSD. So that means it's not only from the year 2010, but it also has to be a Photoshop file. Because it's if it's a Photoshop file, that means it went to Photoshop and came back. That would be the only way I would have PSDs in my Lightroom library or collection. So that should do it. You can add as much more criteria as you want, but that should do it. Click Create, and there's the one file. If I now go do another edit, and we'll do it just quick, we won't do anything to it. But if I go here and again, quickly do a develop and we'll just fix the white balance. That's all. We won't spend any time on anything else. We go into edit, take it over to Photoshop in our last four minutes. And it comes over and we just do a simple levels adjustment just for the sake of doing something. All right, we do a levels adjustment, click OK. We did it destructively, that's fine. Click Save, close. Now if I go to my Smart Collection for 2010 edits, there it is. It's already there because the Smart Collection is always updating what's in it based on the criteria. As soon as something matches that criteria, it automatically adds it. So, just by making the smart collections for each year, and now I'm in 2016, because we're in 2016, every new edit I do gets from every new shot I take this year gets added into my favorite or my edits for that year. So like I said, in my main catalog, I've got 2006 all the way to current year as smart collections, just so I'll be able to visually go back and see which photos I did each year. And also it gives me a count, like it's saying two right now. I can even see which years just at a glance that I did the most shooting because the ones with the most edits were probably the years I did the most shooting. Uh, it's just, and again, is there a purpose for this particular collection other than my own benefit? Not really. It's just for my own benefit. I want to be able to see, see year by year, which edits I did, not necessarily search year by year. Um, so that's what that's for. And those are smart collections and collections and collection sets and collections versus folders. We covered it all. We did it. All right. Let's make sure I'm not missing any other ones here. Hi, for if you're ready. Day two of course seems to be removed from. All right, so someone's saying, whispering to me that the uh, Corey episode for day two has been removed from YouTube. I'll go check it out. It might be a copyright issue with the background music is what I'm guessing, but I'll go look. And next up is Beetle Jace. Beetle Jace is probably lurking in the room already. Uh, Jason, if you're here, let us know. Let's, let's give you some shout outs. But Jason is up next, and uh, you guys should stick around for whatever it is Beetle Jace is going to be doing. I'm sure it'll be great. Any last-minute questions before I have to sign off and let Jason on in the next 60 seconds or so? Let me just refresh the chat just in case I'm missing things. that Sometimes the Twitch chat just stops updating. And I end up not seeing stuff. So just make sure I got everything like over here. I'm not seeing stuff anymore. All right. Any last minute things? It is that time to hand it off to my good friend, Jason Levine. Anything else? Last call for questions. All right, that's my time. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll catch you on the next one. Beetlejuice.